I want to look at you. Don't you want to look at you? I'm not looking at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Stacy Krim, and this is an oral history with Nikki Mintz and April Parker for the Pride of the Community Oral History Project. Mm -hmm. Today is Sunday, May 19th, 2019. Thank you for speaking with me today. Thank you. All right. So where are you both from originally? I'm originally from Wilmington, North Carolina, and I attended UNCG in Greensboro, 1999 to 2003. Mm -hmm. I'm from Jersey. <laughs> You're from Jersey? <laughs> yeah, I'm from Jersey. Uh, the majority of my adult life has been spent in the South, though. So. Mm -hmm. I came here about 2010. 2010. Sorry, 2010. Okay. And I followed my twin. Oh. I know it's going to take a couple minutes before I get. Okay. So, um, what what motivated you to come to to Greensboro? Oh, uh, for me at the time, I was looking at colleges, and this was known as UNC Gay during that time, so <laughs> I was just excited to be here when I arrived. So, Did it live up to the reputation? Um, it did. Uh, in 1999, during the homecoming, it was probably the last time I think that there ever was a parade like that, but there was a big gay float, like a glass slipper, and they were um, playing like club music, and it was a huge celebration. Um, like a big stiletto or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it was like really gay. Um, and then I don't think it was ever a thing after that. But, but yeah, it was cool. Oh, wow. And how did you make it to Greensboro? Um, I followed my twin, much like I did into the world, um, uh, Dr. Parker T. Hurley now. Uh, but he came down here to receive a PhD, which he received, but um, which he earned, rather. Uh, but I found out later on that I have family from North Carolina, so it's nice to, you know, I always say I'm not from the South, I'm of the South, because I have, uh, my paternal family's from North Carolina, Virginia. And did you know that this was known as UNC Gay? No. I came here because my brother built a really lovely queer community, and uh, I have a child who is now 16, and... Uh, I just love the community, so I wanted to be close to my brother, and we raised my daughter pretty much together, and I wasn't willing to remain separate from him, so a year later, um, I bought a rocker. I got a black a black dog that we still have named Jersey. She's never been to Jersey. I adopted her from South Carolina, <laughs> and that's been our story. Yeah. So how did you two meet? You. <laughs> such a good story. It's such a good story. Um... So a year after I landed here, um, when was that? 2013? 2011 to 2013, I attended the library and information studies for my master's degree, which I received. I'm a librarian um, and I was a scholar. And so basically that was an initiative to diversify librarianship. And so, um, yeah, it was a bunch of bad black <laughs> librarians it was really dope um, so I got a full ride you know it was really nice to um, do that work uh, so in that work obviously I uh, focused on small collections of queer queer and black literature and at that time in between 2011 2013 even though it wasn't that long ago you couldn't google queer and black you know you there wasn't there weren't things that were being generated. Now you can, there's think pieces every single day. There's like 20 things that are talking about the intersections of being queer and black. At that time, there was just nothing. Um, so I was doing work with uh, the archives, obviously, because I lived in the with the library, and I did a bunch of work uh, with all of the local um, uh, universities doing that work, and the public library, really. Um, so we stopped here to get some of the LGBTQ uh, history from UNCG and uh, because I was doing a book display downstairs, Jackson Library at, at the very front. And uh, I did a homage to uh, a former, what was, what year was that? I'm gonna give you that documentation too, because I have it. It was either, it was somewhere between 99 and 01. Right, so I found how 
there was a book display about black queer authors that was uh, resisted, protested against and UNCG in 1999. And so I basically replicated that, uh, got the covers of a bunch of black queer artists and um, I established a student chapter of the Progressive Library Guild and we designed this whole thing and come to find out the flyer that I used and the 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 original was by my now wife. So it's really, it kind of just gives you little chills, right? <laughs> like, uh, and I don't know if that's being me being clear. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So uh, I was reading the work of my wife and replicating and honoring the work that she was doing um, those many years ago and didn't even meet her until I graduated two years later. Yeah, so. So Nikki, were you in Pride? when that original book display happened? Yeah, um, I was the president of Pride at UNCG, um, like 01 to 03, and it was me and our group that put that display together. Um, the librarian, one of the librarians, or head librarian or something at the time was one of our, or was our advisor and um because librarians be like <laughs> they were collecting our history yeah. <laughs> yeah and um we got together and uh we wanted to do something about black history but queer and trans and um we put all that together we had black folks in our group and um it was like who's important what can we display and it was uh pretty big at the time you know we had a lot of controversy around it once it was up um and it drove a lot of conversations and uh, some uh, coalition building, but some just, you know, issues were coming up about um, black people feeling like we were taking uh, black history and making it something that it wasn't supposed to be. And, um, you know, we talked with uh, the Neo-Black Society here um, and there was a multicultural sorority um, called One, it was like Theta Nu Xi, um, and they ended up becoming one of our strongest allies. And um, we started more of our programming after that around like sort of like hate-free building, like how do we all work together? Um, but we had this newspaper here, I think it was the Carolinian. Oh, right. Oh, gosh. You have documentation of that, right? And do you remember just... it now? <laughs> okay. The Carolinian just went back and forth and back and forth. Mm -hmm. People, someone was for it. Someone was against it. I cannot it. believe it. in the year 99 to 01 that, because I'm in high school in Jersey at that time, that, you know, I'm from, like, the first city in New Jersey that has, like, a pride crosswalk. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just to see that people were calling in to the library and that kind of, you know, uproar about a book display, I was like, oh, we have to do that again, you know? Well, as we started doing more, um, I don't know, I guess I could say maybe more political things, uh, it started to get difficult. There was uh, a particular student here that advocated very hard against our group after that because our presence, I mean, it was just like everyone was talking about it. The Carolinian was like, flying off the little shelf that, you know, <laughs> you couldn't get the newspaper, which was crazy. But, you know, at that time, print was like, that was where you got your information, you know. Um, we didn't have cell phones pro prominent like it is now. But um, so people were ready to see, like, what was the drama of the this week. This sounds like, like an archive. Yeah. Like, no, we don't have no cell phones. <laughs> That's true. We didn't, we didn't have any phones at the time, which is only 15 Better years ago. Better me on the pager. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so certain people started to want to... Uh, protest or petition student government to get our pride group to lose its funding and they were trying Yikes. to get rid of our student group um but we ended up getting more friends than we lost you know mm -hmm. uh, more community support than you know than we lost um and but, didn't you name pride yeah um, at the top, this is so gay. Um, so Pride was called Pride, but it, we didn't have it. It wasn't like an acronym. And so we came up with something that it could stand for so we could become sort of more political and more representative. And uh, it was called uh, Proudly Representing Individuality, Diversity, and Equality. 
which now my older queer self would know it would be equity and that diversity really reads like white people wanting like Come a black on, person uh, in the room. Um, we've, yeah. <laughs> we've learned a lot from each other. Oh, yeah. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the time, it was just like, you know, we want everybody to individually be themselves. Uh, we wanted diversity, which meant like queer and people calling all the things, but it wasn't really what we were getting. And then equality, we wanted to like be treated. And I want to you know. honor so. those that came before us um, before there could be student organizations or, you know, to the level and to the extent and I want to say that folks um, especially at a historically identified women's college um, the amount of resistance that folks had to do just to wake up every day and get through their days and uh, so I just want to first hold that that we are acting as a continuum of that work um, and just building off of that work and so yeah we might have you know created some sizzles <laughs> in our lifetimes and uh, challenged narratives, um, but it's definitely an honor of those who came before us, so I just want to give thanks to that. Right. And you bring up an interesting point in the name of pride and the issue of diversity and the white people code mm -hmm. of, of that. Um, can you speak of the development of how you understood diversity versus equity, um, especially in the LGBT movement, um, and as the <laughs> LGBT movement uh, became slowly but surely, hopefully, began to ex be less white, so to speak? Can you speak to that development of your understanding? You want. You feel like you I don't think the that they did at that point. We were talking about um, explicitly defined speaking about race wasn't a part of that work mm -hmm. that she did. You know, mm -hmm. I think that illuminating and honoring black queer people was a unique thing. And I think that that's why it stimulated. But I don't think that it was a chronic thing. I don't think that it was. An, I, I believe that, first of all, the LGBTQ movement is inherently black. And I think that it's not, it became black. I think that the whitewashing, you know, people resisted uh, a long, for a long term. There was a lot of people that had to um, fight uh, to, to resist the racism within the community. So the, it's not, you know, nobody's allowing that to be illuminated. People had to die for that to happen. Um, yeah, it's just a really weird terminology when we talk about, you know, what would you so diversity is for white people? I don't know um, how that benefits the white the black community at all when it speaks to that uh, because that's the work that I did was to honor and illuminate the very um, the lives and the magic that was the intersections of queer and black and before we did. Uh, I want to say what is it before two thousand uh, before twenty. 10, 20, 2009, I don't think there had been that over, like centralized, like centralized and building a platform around the intersections of queer and blackness uh, in North Carolina, in this particular, in the triad at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that that was uh, the focus of prior LGBTQ work at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say as far as. Um my organizing or even uh, community sense as a white person. Um, if you, if I were to look back um, during those years at Pride or UNCG, we had black folks that came to our group. And basically at those times it was sort of like, we were all just kind of loving on each other and we wanted everybody to feel good and you know. Um, but I would say it would probably be like five to seven black folks consistently there and then maybe 10 to 15 white folks like always there and we had black folks on our board but it's true like I was a white person and I was president um, I mean nothing that we put in any of our materials or our programming was like here's how to ex explicitly be an anti-racist LGBTQ person or um, we didn't ever unpack whiteness like in our meetings um, uh, a but lot of our topics wouldn't be targeted to like we wouldn't differentiate. Race. Like, say you had a meeting about mental health and being queer and trans, 
uh, we didn't specifically say like, however, black and brown, queer and trans, people of color experienced, et cetera, et cetera, like even more specifically. I mean, a lot of that was that we didn't have a lot of that information. A lot of it was we weren't in that type of community. It was just, um, so it's like if mm -hmm. I looked forward. And they were racist. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I mean. We weren't in that type of community because we were white, racist. We were living in whiteness. But, we didn't, but you we were, didn't have to be. You were you know, like, from, um, you you all indirectly grew up Southerners on New Ground. I mean, that's a 25-year-old uh, that was birthed here. Um, not necessarily in the triad, definitely in the triangle for sure. Um, Southerners on new ground, and then you had um, a bunch of movement happening um, uh, around uh, marriage equality. Um, so a lot of black, queer, brown, queer, trans folks um, central coming together and in, in those kind of resistance. So there were pockets of people and and people in their own communities you know, coming together and organizing themselves, even though it wasn't identified as like this academic co-opted kind of, you know, groups of folks. Yeah, know? like we we had at that time it was like Mandy Carter was the only right. person that we Shout had a relationship with Carter. song. Yeah. yeah, she was always here, a huge presence for this community. Um, we had, there was a unity conference that came around every year that it was like everyone was dying to go to, and that was at UNC Chapel but it, Hill. It but even look here. at UNCG now. You guys, um, have, you've had an LGBTQ coordinator before, and I don't think anybody's ever been queer. And it's always been a white person, a white cis woman, um, and that is violent, you know. And so those things have gone on for decades now, and still present day, we have not rectified those things. So. Mm -hmm. uh, even UNCG has those, you know, what is the larger implications of we're talking about something that happened 20 years ago and we're still here. Um, it can't keep on saying, oh, oh, we don't know, we're, we, we're not in these um, spaces, and then it's like, oh, we can't find queer people. Um, that's a lie, you know. I, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's access, right, and there's who gets to be identified as a leadership and whose voices are valid. And if you say things the proper way, then maybe somebody will listen to you. Um, which is all suppression of how blackness shows up um, and really being threatened by it. So, yeah, it's like it's one thing that 20 years ago you didn't have a LGBT coordinator or even a resource center, but then to over all those years, it's like you think you're creating an advancement for the community, but it doesn't do people of color a service at all when it's a white person or it's a straight person. It doesn't really but serve anybody. But that's Greensboro anybody. as a whole, and more than likely all of uh, North Carolina. I remember when I, my first uh, paid organizing gig uh, with the NAACP, I was a Moral Freedom Summer organizer, and uh, they are in coalition with Equality NC, who took like 12 years to hire their first black person. And they were just like, well, what do you want us to do? I said, change your name from Equality NC. Um, and of course, that leads people to have strained relationships with folks who hold people accountable, like myself. And uh, shout out to Crystal Richardson, who have a wonderful relationship now, but she was the first black person that they hired. Um, and so that's like a large, you know, local but federal organization that has still some of the same racist hiring practices. And then it's about retention and value. It's not just about sprinkling black folks, you know, and it's definitely not about integration. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just saying, like, it's not unique unto UNCG. It's not unique unto Greensboro, who, you know, I mean, shout out. We had uh, Guilford Green Foundation has never um, hired a person of color um, on, until maybe Ivy Gee. And I think everybody who's gotten some of their... Um, what are they? I, I want to call them stipends, but they're not stipends. They're small grants that they offer. Um, everybody had to go through me or my organization, the Queer People of Color Collective, uh, because they weren't doing the work for and, you know, with uh, my community, which is queer and black trans folks. So I'm just saying that to say that this is a, a larger issue because I don't think that there's one organization that I can say that we would list right now that has centered the lives and lived experiences of queer black and trans folks until um, I mean obviously southerners on new ground but, but uh, I think that they 
pride themselves on uh, maybe like a multiracial strategy, which is great. You know, I think everybody has their work that they need to do, but explicitly, I mean, I think I think ebbs and flows. I think that they've done amazing work, um, and and have have changed their narrative and and as, as needed. Okay, and Nikki, when you were uh, president of Pride, what was the trans representation like on campus? Do you have any idea of that? Uh, no, it was very minimal. Um, we didn't have a lot of relationships with trans folks. There might have been two or three people that came to our regular meetings. Um, you know, we always said LGBTQ. Some of us were using queer as a term. Uh, some people in our community didn't like that. Um, we didn't have language like gender nonconforming, non-binary. Um, it, it, things have just grown um, as far as like naming things. Um, but I remember, you know, it was like trying to research like hate crime statistics or uh, suicide for queer and trans people on campus, things like that that were specific when we were trying to um, get our non-discrimination policy change to include sexual orientation. Um, and it was like all the police reports were zero. There was just zero. And it's like, that's not true. You know, we know people in our community that are going through stuff, um, drinking, whatever, stuff like that. And um, so it was kind of like, where do you get this information? I mean, do you start like a whole research study on your own? Like who wants to hear it? Where do you get it? How do you start to define your own group anymore? It's like, where do you, where do you find the rest of us to um, build these numbers to give people statistics so that they can see an importance of something or, you know, um, that you could see trends of what was going on with us just even on campus or out in the community. Um, but, you know, at that time, there was basically GLSEN. Um, there was, who was also Replacements Limited, um, and... Hmm. Uh, NCCJ. And NCCJ, um, and Guilford Green. That was like a dinner that they did. We always did Dining for Friends, which was the HIV AIDS awareness. I mean, those were, we only had like two or three things in the community at all. Um, and so you know and uh, the clubs you had we have we have two we have one club in greensboro which is really white cis gay men club at this time um but how many did you have then that is true i'm telling you <laughs> what we did was we got off campus as fast as we could we went to our little pride meetings on thursday night and we <laughs> went to uh babylon which was a gay club right downtown on elm street uh and that was kind of more like grown folks there and then the, all of us college kids we would go to uh time out over on uh what is that spring garden no what is that? market market yeah so time out was where like the queer women would go a lot of times um and then the palm palm room was where black queer folks would go which was downtown kind of around the corner from time out and then mugs was there, which was black, hey. and a lot of times women, <laughs> not so much black gay men. Um, and then a lot of times we were catching rides together and going out of town. I mean, I'm talking like every weekend we lived for it because that was like the way we could all be together. Uh, we would go to Odyssey and Winston Salem, uh, which was like black hip hop on one part of the club, and you could walk through the club, and it was like a whole like white gay techno EDM whatever. So it was kind of like, you know, we were all there, but it was still largely racially segregated. Um, but everybody was cool because we were all just gay as hell. And then uh, <laughs> you lived for North Carolina Pride, which was in Durham every year. And there was a club that you could go to called Visions. Um, and a lot of times Visions sponsored or, you know, it was like the club to go to during that Pride, North Carolina State Pride. And so you got to see like all of the queer and trans folks around the state and uh, Visions was just huge. That was outdoor and indoor, which was big for us because we didn't have outdoor indoor here um, or in Winston. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean. Like, right. there wasn't a lot and no, available, even, even when but that I, was a lot to us because now it's true. Like, yeah, even when I got here, there was probably, like, what, five yeah. in town? And now we're down to one that nobody really goes to. And I really feel like that's, like, social media. People just relate differently. And there's mm -hmm. all these dating apps and stuff. Like, people just don't go out like that in our community. And I don't know what that is about that. But 
Um, you know, because straight well, people are definitely blowing up the bars downtown. I but think that kickbacks and house parties have made a resurgence. You know what I'm saying? To be honest, yeah. uh, if you ask me what queer black people do, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what it looked like. It doesn't always look like, you know, going to the club anymore. That might have been, you know, things ebbs and flows, you know. It's like, yeah, we're also 30-something now. Right. But, you know, I mean, 30-something now. Um, but it is true. Like, I would give anything to just be in, like, a whole queer and trans space and be out somewhere. Like, I don't want to just be at the house and, and have to call just our certain friends that we know. Like, where can we really find our community? And, I mean, you really got to dig. Like, And that's the word There's, like, did. LGBTQ meetup. And it's like, why? I don't... Who even uses meetup anymore? I before mean, the... Like, before... Um, I'm on, like, a sabbatical for the last year from movement work. But before that, that's what the Queer People of Color Collective was really, its origins was around cultural, social, you know, events and programs and workshops and stuff like that. It wasn't It wasn't until the Black Lives Matter movement that it become, like, overtly political. But it was really about building community. And, uh, yeah, those things are different now. So um, let's just, because we have a special interest in this project with gay bars in the area, can you walk us through? You're going to Babylon, you walk through the door, what do you see? What you see? Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I mean, at that time it was, oh, uh, well. Uh, you know, drag drag life is a big thing. There was lots of drag queens. Um uh, it was upbeat dance music, you know, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, a gay club when there's mirrors <laughs> and boxes that you could dance on at the time, um, just stuff like that. It was just a good time. I mean, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just a good time. Time out was more kind of laid back. It was, it's small, kind of like a bar. Yeah, you know? it's so funny. Now the palm room was black folks just getting down, like I mean down. It was like it was like upbeat hip hop stuff like that, you know. And I mean the dance moves. It's like you you won't see that anywhere else. You don't see that at Babylon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then mugs was like you know kind of hip hop chill, some kind of some part bar, some part like I don't know, but. I mean, places would be packed, and Time Out was like, if you wanted, it was like $3 pitchers of Bud Light or something. I mean, that was like, you go there if you just want to, like, drink beer and pregame, and then you go to the Palm Room, or you go to uh, Babylon, or you go on and get out of town, you know, to go, like, really party. Um, But, you know, that was a lot for us who were on campus or, you know, in our 20s, and, you know. Um, Yeah, and from Wilmington... The only club we had was, it was called Mickey Rats, uh, and that was there from, like, the 80s up until the early 2000s. I know this is a project about the triad, so I'm going to make it short, but um, that was the only club that survived North Carolina for, like, tons of decades that I can recall. Um, What's the one in Raleigh? And then, I don't know the one in Raleigh. Yes, you do. Oh, uh, oh God, uh, Legends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Legends is still there. That's yeah. one of the originals, Yeah. Mickey's closed down, and they uh, made Ibiza in Wilmington. Uh, but it's true. I mean, during the 80s, there was a lot of, like, coke and stuff like that from what I heard. Um, in the <laughs> 90s, it was a lot less. And then, you know, drugs, it was, like, what, ecstasy, like they called E or whatever. Um, and then, like, the 2000s, it was just drinking. And I don't know, it just kind of chilled out. So, <laughs> But there were trans folks, but it wasn't – I don't know how to explain it. And obviously, I guess that was my cis privilege – um, and just how our community was, it was like the way that people name things now and use that identity as a way to like really concrete themselves in those conversations. Like it wasn't like that. It was like, okay, this person is a little different or uh, this person dresses like this today or they go by this name or they're out here dancing and doing whatever. And that was like what it was. Um, now, I mean, there's a lot of power in different ways around saying who you are, you know. Um, which I I think that people were uh, much more oppressed in those different ways that it wasn't like welcomed in our conversation. It wasn't 
you know, tell me more about who you are if you're a trans person or you're gender nonconforming or you're so you dress in drag, like are you a There's cis also man? A lot, like a lot of free love you know? for what you tell me, babe. Yeah, I'm everybody sure. was just <laughs> <laughs> doing whatever they wanted to do. <laughs> so, it's true. There was no like code, you know what I mean? It's true. Like you could dance any way you wanted to dance, you could date whoever you wanted and i don't know i mean maybe that was just my little piece in my community I, that might not be everybody's experience you know um there were a lot of folks in our community that were very isolated um particularly in uncg we had people that came from danville virginia because there was no place right. to go um and that was like an hour mm-hmm. two hours north or whatever and they came because they were like, y'all are the only gay thing that we've got. It was like, really? Like, uh, at UNCG? Like, I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Like, mm-hmm. uh, and that was that was big. And we had GLASS, um, the Gay Lesbian Adolescent Support System. Um, and we had a little house down there. I can't remember the name of the house, but they did HIV AIDS support group there. Um, I mean, a lot of that stuff, you had to really look for it. <laughs> um but yeah, I hope I answered your question about the clubs. It was good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I would give anything to have the clubs <laughs> yeah, back. Right. I'm like, really man, right. I get my thirties to look like that. Come on, man. <laughs> just to have a place to go and just be queer as hell. Like, take my wife now. Like, come on, man. Like <laughs> We're pretty gay wherever we go though. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. We're always like <laughs> we went out matching last night. That was gay. Yeah, yeah. We have to gay off our own places now. It's truly, like, truly, yeah. truly, truly, truly. Yeah, you walk around downtown Greensboro. And it's like we're the homos, you know. But it's cool. So, um, I guess so. Slowly, as North Carolina became more uh, politically active in anti-LGBT initiatives, its its legislation became more vocal. Mm-hmm. When did you start, um, when did either of you start um, actively working with social movements to work with um, protesting against those uh, the, that legislation? Well, tell the truth. I mean, like m- most folks, uh, you know, you do your political activism in college and then because of you know, her privilege and also her life, you know, going back to Wilmington, which is a majority white city, uh, those that effort kind of died down for mm-hmm. her and went dormant um, for the better part of a decade, probably longer. Yeah. So for black people, I would argue that that's not common. You have, you know, pe- your activism is birthed out of your need to live, you know, and to survive, you know, and to give yourself and your community what it needs, you know. It's, it's not like one day I just want to have all of these um, causes, you know what I'm saying? Like your whole life is the cause, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. uh, when I got down here, I can't, I mean, even I was a sociology major uh, with my bachelor's degree. I can't say I was incredibly woke, but I was a single black mom, you know what I'm saying? Like here, um, I started identifying as queer and uh I don't know, we've just built like the revolution on my front porch, you know what I'm saying? And it was really uh, one of those things. I didn't even lock the door the first year that I lived here because my house was like a hub, you know, 30 people for Sunday dinners and everybody was sparked with, you know, those kind of, especially because I lived in Glenwood, you know, and they were having the talk, uh, lots of talks around Uh, the colonizing that UNCG has encroached upon, you know, Glenwood. So that was all ongoing conversations. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so um, I think that the queer community, I mean, because LGBTQ, let's just like, I don't know if anybody explicitly said this, uh, it's not the same community. (laughs) We... (laughs) There's so many, even in the lesbian community, like I'm not a lesbian. My wife's never identified as a lesbian. Um, and we could talk about all of those things. Why I identify as a queer black femme um, and Nikki's queer. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we went and we were in, well, when I was in a queer community, um, it was white. You know, when I moved down here and the folks that my brother, uh, Cacolac Thunder, uh, was a drumming. How would you describe it? It's a, it's like a drum court for protest, protest. basically. Yeah. Like they're like a socially conscious drum group. So, so my brother got involved with them, and they were predominantly white at the time. 
Um, and they had been, they, they did their thing for like, what, 12 years, a little bit over 12 years. Um, anyway, so my brother and a family a member of ours, um, my, I lived in Glenwood and down the street, there was a collective house and it had, it had turned over a couple of times, but <laughs> my brother, my twin, lived in the only black collective in North Carolina and they were together for about a year and between those two houses and then knowing all of our neighbors that's a really powerful thing when you could go on every block and you know somebody on every block you know what I'm saying I never experienced anything like that um, so if something popped off in the community and people were already connected and politically engaged and civically aware. Um, it was nothing to mobilize people, you know what I'm saying? Because we were all deeply connected because we had built that community. Um, and so it came from a needs-based place. So that's when they had established the Queer People of Color Collective. And when I moved down here within that year, I had, um, because both of the, uh, the founders basically had um, transitioned into doing other things. Uh, I kept it rolling because I'm just been socialized around black folk and it wasn't easy for me to be around a whole bunch of white folks all the time. Um, and all I had to do was ring the alarm one good time and it was, it was done. It was, I still have, after doing that in 2010, 2011, I still have my closest family is birthed out of that original queer people of color collective. Um, so I think that that was a political act, you know, and obviously the work that I did with uh, UNCG. So that's going to be hard to break down. <sighs> Let's start with um, your, as you began your involvement in taking over the work with queer people of color, the queer people of color collective. Well, I just started learning really what like grassroots organizing looked like, you know. Um, and it looks a little, it looks a lot different from what it looks like now because I feel like over the years, uh, the way people um, acquire money to fund their, like everything for me when I first got there, uh, I did all of my work for free. And I was able to, because UNCG was paying me to earn my master's degree. I was able to do some projects with the intersections of community organizing and librarianship, you know. So I did uh, like an LGBTQ story time at the public library, and now I'm on the board of public libraries. You know what I'm saying? It's interesting how that works. Um, but they wouldn't let that, that took years of like busting down doors and like, you know, literally, and that's not me standing on top of tables to be like, we're here, you know what I'm saying? And and sometimes, you know, Greensboro always looks at the person who kicks the door open, like, but at least I can see that there's a bunch of people who then were able to come into the space, you know, um, even to my detriment at sometimes. Um, but yeah, the work was fun. It was uh, queer black um, art shows, and it was basically like all my friends were so magical and talented. So it was like, oh, you're an author? We're going to do a book club. I'm going to get it funded. Uh, we would start opening up space elsewhere museum. I, uh, George here is one of my closest friends now. But I started by sweeping his floor in elsewhere museum. And nobody knew my name. And, you know, uh, now anybody who's part of, like, Black Lives Matter movement and the queer people of color collective and people who are really young folks who identify similarly to me are they're able to go into that space for free um, because we've built so much programming with them we've really queered and black this uh, made the space so black <laughs> and that wouldn't have happened you know what I'm saying without that original work so the original work was fun you know it was about centralizing folks opening up space um, really reclaiming space you know what I'm saying like this is ours um so it was book fair it was the book clubs like my if my friend was a singer we would do like um, a pride talent show and we would bring ourselves downtown um 
so for me it was a lot of that cultural work you know what i'm saying like bringing in um like bringing in folks from other parts uh, uh dr alexis pauline gums has been really great about coming in and sharing herself um as a nc um rep she goes hard for nc particularly durham um and then blm happened and we felt and the, so after maybe oh gosh how many years it was like 2014 so after maybe five years of just cultural work where we were building community um sharing resources uh helping each other you know if somebody needed a licensure um raising money for people to make sure that they were accomplished oh you need to go to this conference oh you need to go to the doctor really centralizing resources for each other and sharing that it was powerful um we we uh opened up an office downtown greensboro uh it was with, our landlord was one of the biggest gentrifiers in greensboro but that rent was three hundred dollars and it was downtown <laughs> it was like a central location so it was popping <laughs> for us you know what i'm saying um yeah and we held that space for like two years you know um we did like holiday hotline stuff for folk, you know, um, we worked with the queer labs. Um, I brought the lesbian her, her story archives down here. Um, I did a read out loud photo exhibit. I'm going to give that to you. So when Pete, cause, um, to resist the over sexualization of our people, I basically did a photo exhibit and like, um, a search engine, um, uh, like what's that called? I haven't done that work in so long. Um, algorithm kind of thing, where when you searched us, it wasn't just pictures of like porn. You know, it was definitely um, it was pictures of people reading to each other, and they're like, oh, that's boring. No, at that time, that was radical because it just did not exist. And um, you know, we're like I'm gifting some of those portraits to you know, the libraries and having them, um, uh, like in Guilford College and stuff like that, hang those up. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that was fun work. And then it was also, I think, some of the conversations, because when you're doing work, you, it was a coalition. North Carolina has a rich history, especially with the NAACP and the Moral, um, Moral Monday movement uh, with coalition building, everybody working together you know what I'm saying? Even though now I can say we operate in silos. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And nobody's explicitly doing anything queer. Like, explicitly queer. But when I came in um, after 2011, uh, there were groups of people working together in any way, shape, or form that they possibly can. And I think that we started doing that too locally. So it was nothing to pot partner with... Um, G Save and um, U Save, and um, even though eventually doing that and also holding a mirror to you know anti blackness, um, it causes you know it causes strains and it's not easy to hold on to each other in that struggle and. Um, I, like I said, everything's in ebb and flows, but we were also unapologetically black, unapologi unapologetically black in the sense of, if you were doing racist mess, you know what I'm saying. We were very public uh, about it. You know, we went against Guilford Green Foundation for hiring the mayor, you know, uh, Nancy Vaughn, as a cis white person to be the face of Guilford Green Foundation. Uh, we we just um, every step of the way, if we could push back against the racism in the LGBTQ community, we were the folks that did it. And then, so it was a natural progression for us to then kind of, they were they were operating at the same time, but sometimes they were enmeshed, whether it was the Queer People of Color Collective and the BLM chapter of Greensboro, which I was the co-creator of both, you know what I'm saying? Um, along with a bunch of folks that, I mean, I can share their names with you, or you can just, they can, it, that's a quick Google. 
<laughs> That's a really quick Google. Um, and then it became overtly political where some of the the more cultural events, because by virtue of um, capacity, was impossible, but also kind of sad because I wish we still had those things now. And I feel that if we didn't choose one over the other, which I think by design the systems is our, cause us to do, they would still be popping and we would still be able to have that. Um, and who knows, we might be able to do that again in another shape, shape or form. But yeah, when Trayvon Martin hit uh, the uprisings and Mike Brown, you know, uh, was slain, we immediately saw it our responsibility to queer the conversation. And not only just to queer the conversation, but to define what state violence is. You know what I'm saying? Like poverty being violent, you know, um, police brutality, uh, being in a, a, a state of surveillance uh, chronically, uh, what that does, uh, mass incarceration. Uh, so we weren't just talking about intersectional identities. We were talking about intersectional issues. We weren't trying to do no one issue. And I think that that's a little bit of the difference between the organizi organizing that happened when my wife was doing work is that it was like issue 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 definitely and partnership 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 but we saw these all as interconnected because you know we want to lift up kimberly crenshaw you know and 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 giving us the coin phrase of intersectionality for us to have an understanding of as a black queer woman i don't know what's hitting me but i know something's hitting me i don't know whether it's the sexism or the racism or the homophobia but you know if all of it's happening at the same time it doesn't prove uh, it doesn't prove us to anything for us to just have like one solution when it's just multiple issues um so people were brilliant in that way and it was powerful um to kind of uh add a lot of level of nuance and it was queer black people that did that period queer black trans people that did that hands down and so it it never just like stonewall riot and all of the his, his, you know, all of the other uprisings that have happened, queer black trans people were at the forefront, um, whether their names will ever be known or not. You know, uh, we were the ones on the ground. Um, I mean, Beyonce gave Equality MC money, and it's okay, Beyonce, we love you. <laughs> but I always use that as an example of when people want to do good work or do something. In allyship, you don't know necessarily more than what mainstream white folks want to allow you to know sometimes because of the stronghold around uh, resources and history that they tend to um, dominate. So if Beyonce gave equality and C, but she didn't, when, when HB2 um, was, she didn't know that we were the ones in front of the governor's mansion shutting things down, that we had been the ones shutting down pride. Um, now everybody wants to talk about how Stonewall was a riot, but that's because of years of resistance between BLM, Toronto shutting down, and that was really uh, beautifully done um, to where now I think that folks around the whole entire world are getting police out of prides and trying to really get capitalism out of prides, you know, um, and kind of honor it for what it originally was. But um, people have to do a lot of work and, 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 and hardship. I'm tired now. I'm tired just explaining all this. <laughs> I really am. I'm tired. I need some water. <laughs> but yeah, um, so there's just a lot of work. Um, yeah, I don't even know. You get into that vortex of what happened, you know? Yeah. So now it's kind of, um, you know, Southerners do a new ground, has a, a lot more. Um, they're blacker in North Carolina than I think that they've ever have been, really. Um, and so they're doing the Black Mama bailouts and stuff like that. And so those are queer folks that are doing that work. And I think that people are doing the work as they can. I also think that the triad just can't retain queer, black, and trans people. I mean, if there is some mobility, if if folks can get out of here, they usually do. 
um, just because of the very nature. <laughs> There's just no nothing for us here. You know what I'm saying? Greensboro will always lose its best if they do not start um, changing some of the things that I talked about, period. Or they just be um, students that leave, you know? And we just live in a transient place. And so, like, our community is always, you know, in flux, you mm -hmm. know? Um, Durham has an awesome uh, popular community right now. So, yeah. Okay. Um, somewhat related to this, can you speak to the climate of institutionalized prejudice against LGBT populations or queer people of color in the triad area? I think that Greensboro has really done a good job of proving, like, this proclamation of being so progressive. And that really doesn't mean anything, that people are still dying, that black people on the east side of Greensboro are still living 15 years less than the white people on the west side. You know, so what is progressive and liberals really doing other than killing black people too? Um, but I think Greensboro really being, like, the heart of the civil rights movement, which, you know, integration without economic justice what is inherently violent. And so we're still receiving the later ramifications of that. Um, run me back, because I got real upset right now. Run me back. What was the question? <laughs> um, it's any institutionalized prejudice against the LGBT population? Oh, I just think that the, like, basically what I'm saying is, is that Greensboro, the first example was that we keep on getting the HRC award, but HRC has been problematic since its inception, really. So if you keep on getting awards, you know, you get to say, oh, we're doing this work, but I have working relationships with people, uh, elected officials, and if you ask them one explicit thing that they're doing for our community, they wouldn't be able to name it. So I think that if you cannot name it, then you cannot serve it, and that's a problem. Uh, we gathered 400 people um, for the Black Women and Girl Matter, um, like a Say Her Name. Um, it was work that Kimberly Crenshaw was doing nationally. And so we hosted that and we had people observe what people were experiencing. Like basically it was like panels of folks where people were talking about their lives and um, the deficits that they were experiencing and there's uh there's little follow-up but at least people know and that was only two years ago so now we see a lot more programming but programming won't get us free you know programming is a band-aid you know people confuse charity with equity a lot and i think that that's because uh greensboro loves a nonprofit. the triad loves a nonprofit. Um, but essentially, they're there to, you know, act as a gap filler, but it doesn't eradicate what's, what's causing the ill. It's not, that's not what its job is. It's not there to do that. And when we, and when you have people doing that work, it's severely underfunded. So I appreciate when that there's people still on the ground trying to at least reclaim our black tax dollar in order to make sure that work is actually getting done that gets to the root of the problem. I think HB2 became the conversation about capitalism over community, which was a problem. There was no trans black people that spoke on the state house when that hit. Um, and the dialogue comes to, like, and that's the whole thing is I think that people forget when Charlotte, okay, now this is storytelling. When Charlotte did their um, ordinance around, you know, LGBTQ people, particularly trans people, can go to any, you know, washroom, restroom, whatever. Um, they were talking about it being citywide. Greensboro's ordinance passed unanimously because it was only talking about city property city city owned so greensboro gets to act like they're most progressive even though charlotte when they said we want everything to be accessible hours and hours of this public lynching that happened at city council against the trans community particularly 
um, happened, you know, for days and days on end that prompted HB2 to even exist. Greensboro gets to have like this underlying like, oh, we're so great, but it's only because they didn't push the envelope. It wasn't saying everybody, it's not a mandate for everybody, it's just city property. So could you imagine what would happen if Greensboro actually did what Charlotte did? But Greensboro wouldn't because then it would actually bring out, um, we, we get to be, we are not this. That's the common phrase of Greensboro. Uh, love is love, you know? <laughs> so they get to be these pseudo progressive folks, but it really is deceptive for people who don't know the differences between the ordinances. So when those things happen, um, you know, people come together, particularly, you know, white people get to come in and do that whole unity thing. But um, it's what? Tell me. Nothing, but go ahead. No, tell me. No, you go ahead. No, because it's tiring. I really am. Tell me. Well, I was going to just sort of tag on to mm -hmm. um, some specific things around Please institutional do. oppressions to LGBT folks of color and LGBT Thank white you. people. Thank you. Please. Um, well, I was just going to say, like, even just being with April as a black queer woman, um, just finding a mental health therapist in this area at all is like, where? There's just nothing explicitly available. Um, so, and me coming from UNCG with a social work degree is true if you look for a therapist that's just explicitly queer at all. Um, you know, you go to like psychologytoday.com to try to find somebody and they might say like they can touch on LGBTQ issues or I think theirs is just like gay lesbian issues. I don't even know if they're even like advanced in the language yet. Um, but there's, you know, it kind of like tags on to just other issues. It's kind of like, okay. And then like you hope that you go to this therapist and they're actually queer or trans and they're not. Um, and so it's like, dang, like they like kind of mm -hmm. get it, but they're not, but like they want to be there for you, but they just don't get it, you know? Um, and so that's kind of a thing. Um, and a lot of times you get sort of pathologized because you're queer, like maybe that's why you have these certain issues and it's like, no, actually like a lot of people have these issues and you know, we're also just queer or trans. And, um, I also used to work at an insurance company, um, and we were the first, maybe only still, I don't know, in the state, um, that provided transgender specific, uh, gender specific coverage for hormone replacement therapy um, and gender confirmation therapy, I mean, um, surgery. So, um, but even that, our company wasn't properly trained for it. People didn't know what cis was at all. Um, you know, you kind of, it sort of was sort of tagged into our training um, under like whole bits of information around open enrollment. And so you're learning like all these major things that were coming out and then it's like, oh, and then we also are like trans inclusive and it's like, what does that even mean? Um, and so a lot of times I was sort of unofficially getting, uh, my coworkers would sort of send people to me when they called in because I knew how to at least talk to people around these questions. And uh, they hired like a couple of people to specifically take those calls. And, you know, but nothing institutionally changed as far as like, how do we talk about trans specific issues? But as our state, you know, it's not like that's fundamentally a part of our insurance plans. Um, trans people don't have access to he health care like they should. Um, so as far as like mental health institutional oppression and uh, physical health institutional oppression, um, just the requirements that you have to meet to even qualify to get your own, um, surgery or your hormone replacements, just all right, the hair removal saying, is it, considered cosmetic. So it's elective. It wasn't um, with the whole HB2 conversation. It was never really about the impact on people it was really about oh it's not a good look <laughs> yeah so the and like the, the basketball tournament came and, and right. they made it about economics right. it wasn't even about like and that's did North Carolina want to be pro trans and queer people it polarized black and queer people people like oh uh you'll boycott it because it's against gay people but what about what you do to black people and it's just like black people are queer people. So it really set us back as far as a national dialogue around the intersection of black and queerness and trans folks, for sure. And also as a white person, what I also saw was um, as far as like Black Lives Matter and queer and trans black people were basically a mess in Kupac and Black Lives Matter all together, right? Like they didn't separate their identities or communities and who they were spending time with. And so what I would witness is like 
the Greensboro massacre always being on the city council agenda, you know, things like that to get it named, to get a sign, to get an apology, to acknowledge it. It was queer and trans black people that were pushing back at those city council meetings in April and people just disrupting all those things, you know, to kind of bring that urgency that um, cis hetero older generations of black people have been doing forever. And it's like without all of those people coming together, all those working parts over these generations, you know, for this movement to have been happening like in this period, prime legislation and things were happening for black people cis people or black history or you know it's like there's no there's no division among it april is just as much black as she's queer people are just as much trans as they are black and it's like those same people were fighting for that to happen and if as a white queer person if i were to look at all my white community of queer people they weren't largely parts of those conversations they weren't largely in those relationships mm -hmm. they weren't out in the actual street for hb2 you know they were in boardrooms or conference rooms or meeting spaces or on phone calls which is important work i'm not taking away from that work but i also saw young black trans and queer people without all of those resources available to putting them putting their bodies on the line doing that work plus those mm -hmm. parts of being in danger being at the hands of the police um you know experiencing physical violence from the police um, being hated by the white queer and trans community. Right. Um, and then <laughs> that part <laughs> and, and went on were those pride shutdowns for those few years, you know, black people were like enough is enough. What about us? And you know, if I were to look, there was a separate black pride just to put that out there. There's always and, been a separate black pride. Right. Yeah. And so, um, now, um, J blue, J city lights. Um, I would love for you to speak to her. Um, they were doing now they are together but that's after years of having two separate ones so it's not like we made it the problems like that's the thing that people don't understand just because we were talking about the problems doesn't mean that they weren't existing for like a thousand years so yeah. um uh so it would be you you could see that clearly when you looked at what was happening in greensboro it's like yeah you now have organizations and people that are agitating around these issues but people were making a way because of the racism or because of the inability to you know work together and so when you have a voice like mine and other people that i've been uh that i was uh building with saying these things publicly it, it's easier to say oh we were generating these things or we are that was the pushback from a white community like we, that we were the wrong ones but i said i didn't make two black pride i didn't make a black pride in a in a regular pride that was there before i got here yeah i'm just talking about why it is you know what i'm saying like and so they work together now but that's after you know the pride folks had already you know tried to call the police on me for, in a meeting you know what i'm saying like those are things that had to happen um for other people to make way for other people to work together um unfortunately and I, you know i just want to say like as a white queer person like it's it's not something to be ashamed about it's just something to mm -hmm. do something else about like if i were to look back at my organizing it was really fast forward 10 years later i, I meet april and it's like holy shit like I, I thought I was thinking intersectionality. I knew about Kimberly Crenshaw. I read books about black lesbian feminism and queerness and stuff from the 70s, but like it wasn't inherently how I was doing my work. And when I met April, I saw how you can actually do that work, you know, and it really started with that community. You open up your home first, you open up that little office first, and it's not going to be on a major website that Beyonce could Google and give her money to. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't have to have all those resources. It's not a, a cookie cutter place you can walk into yeah, and get and your it's pamphlet. Messy. And but the it's, process is messy because we're not, we're not stand like decades old institutions. So our meetings and our dialogue and how we generate uh, shared wealth is not going to look like, right, like a white supremacist origin kind of space. And and even in my leadership, I've had many failings um with not meeting people where they are um just a lot <laughs> so i just don't want to just say like i learned a lot from folks and i learned a lot from folks in the aftermath of it too i think self-care was an afterthought after years of 
community organizing and using protests as a tactic. I want to be clear about that. I'm not a protester. I'm a community organizer who uses voting is also a tactic that I utilize. Um, there's a bunch of tactics that we can implement. But um, after all those years, um, self-care was an afterthought um, that I think that now people are like, oh, we have to pace ourselves. Because in that minute and in those moments, we thought we were going to get free any minute because that was the visceral feeling. That was the palpitation. That was that was the beat on the street. You know what I'm saying? We thought we was going to get free because everybody around us was just awake at that time. And we saw things in ways that I don't think that us as a society has seen together and collectively since what? The 1970s? Even blackness was popping in the 1990s, too, in a different way. I want to like say one thing world. before we go because we only have a few minutes. But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to interrupt you. No. Oh, well, when you're talking about originally had, like, when did you become politicized? I wanted to go, like, way back because it's like we see current um, issues and organizing and how April has done this work as intersectionally as she has. Um, and for me, in, like, 1999, 2000, are are two things that I was focusing on in our community, which when I look back was like really pretty inherently white. Um, and so our two things at the time, the Defense of Marriage Act had passed in like 1996 with President Clinton. And we also had Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the military. And so here I was in 99, basically learning about my queer history for the first time ever, because I didn't learn it in high school. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have a queer student alliance. I was the only out person in my school. I come to UNCG and it was like the old pride board came and they were like, here's this history of these politics. You, you should know that. And they kind of took me in and taught me stuff. And that was how I became politicized. And I started with just our school. Like, I, you know, as a student, I wasn't thinking of Greensboro, you know. And uh, so here I was UNCG and I was like, what in the world? Our non-discrimination policy is messed up. We had just this little separate, it was literally a clause was what it was called. Um, and it, it was, I can't remember, it was like a diversity clause or something. And it was kind of like just this little blurb that was like, you know, we also welcome um, people with their sexual orientation. But then there was actually the legit non-discrimination policy above it, you know, and this little blurb of, yeah, like hands, <laughs> hands person. And so me and this white gay man, cis man in our group, um, we were the two students that were like, this has to be different, y'all. And we tried to rally our own pride group, which was generally at least 25 to 35 people came every Thursday. And so we had a large room, you know, and it was like the white gays were like, you're being too political, which is very much what happens a lot in our community with white gays. Um, they don't want to touch it. It's like, why? Like, let's go have fun and party. And then the black gays were like, I'm not messing with that. Like, I'm not getting in trouble. I'm not getting removed from school. I'm not putting myself at risk. Like, this is already hard enough. And it was kind of like, well, what are we going to do, y'all? And it was like, we had to basically even survey our own group. Like, do you want this? Is this important? And people were like, yeah, but we don't want to be political. Um, which is something that April experienced years later with her own QPOC organizing. People don't really want to touch political a lot, especially black and brown folks, because of the risk that it causes. But queer and trans people need to be together just so much. It's almost like, I don't want to think about all those things. I just want to be <laughs> here. I just want to see people like me. I just want to go bowling. You know what I mean? Like, uh, because straight straightness is such a dominant thing. It's like, thank God we can just be together. And you don't want it to be hard. You know what I mean? Um, but so we changed the non-discrimination policy here to be what it is now. Um, there was like five or six schools out of the whole UNC system that even had it. Um, so that was my first, you know, very outwardly politicized move. Um, I was an RA on campus, which at the time was a community advisor. They were called CAs and I was the only out queer, um, resident hall person at all. Um, and so it was like the resident department just like loved that about me. Um, and I was in an all girls dorm and, you know, but, and so they always called me the gay CA in gray. Like it was like, it, but it was a cool thing, you know? And so I affected people that way, just being out. And then, um, at that time was the hate crimes bill. And when I, when I think about Black Lives Matter, um, and the things that I learned watching, organizing the way that it happens now, at that time, in 99, Matthew Shepard was killed. Uh, he was a young student. He's actually from 
Uh, he went to Catawba College, but he was in Washington State. And his mother, Judy Shepard, uh, who was a cis, straight, white woman, um, was trying to create a hate crimes bill to be passed to make it illegal and to even get her son's murder to be considered a hate crime, which was a huge uh, thing. And she, she was doing this in Washington and touring the whole country. And around that same time, a black man, a cis, uh, hetero black man named James Byrd, um, in Jasper, Texas, he was uh, murdered. He was, well, I don't, and you could research, I could talk about the details of these things, but basically because he was black and it was a hate crime about him being black in Texas. And so it was like the his family and Judy Shepard, they partnered together to really pave this way to talk about hate crime legislation. And so we organized around that, but it wasn't anything here. Like we didn't shut down streets and protest about hate crimes. We went to DC, right? And we went to like rallies there that were like safe organized rallies, you know? And we listened to these speakers all the time. And we thought it was so cool that they came to our campus. Like we didn't organize the way that people are organizing now in their twenties and thirties. Mm. And I just feel like um, if you look at Black Lives Matter, it was that similar message was there. It was like, cis hetero black well, I people don't, or I black don't think that you, that's mobilizing and that was policy change so you were working on policy reform it just named differently but go ahead yeah so if you look at black lives matter it, it was queer black women who were starting that and it was to lift up you know police state sanctions violence and brutality and murder to black people and a lot of times the victim that was lifted up or that was occurring was a cis black boy or cis black man or a hetero person and it was queer women lifting up those voices and you know the outcries were what about black trans women what about black queer women what about women period you know and so that intersectionality was forming amongst black people just in their own movement and you're also like where are all the white people and particularly where are the white trans people and the white queer people like we're like off on the sidelines you know um, but it's, you know, there's no perfect victim. And if you rally behind that community, that's really what needs to be, it's the issue that needs to be addressed, you know? Um, but you can't do it without uplifting those voices. And so if I were to rewind back in time, I would think that what I was being impressed upon me was that hate crimes against black people were black men. And that's really terrible that this is happening to black men or hate crimes against, you know, my community as a queer person it mostly happens to black, um, to white gay guys. And that's really terrible, you know, because that's like that image. Why are you getting upset? What? Why are you getting upset? No, babe. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just learning those those differences like even if that's an image that is what's coming out there's an entire community behind that that's being affected and there were black and brown uh queer and trans people and queer women that were experiencing hate crimes during that time it wasn't only matthew shepherd but it's it's matthew shepherd and james bird that you know grew from that you know and created a catalyst for that but um so anyways those were the things that were happening at that time and when I fast forward and look at BLM and all the things that were happening there, a lot of those conversations seem very much the same. Um, but it, I don't know, just the mobilizing and the power behind it just seems a lot different. Um, and it's true without those things. To me, I feel like the movement is what it is today because of even the way that we were doing our organizing work, it wasn't explicitly black and brown. Um, it was inherently racist in the ways that we did it. And so if it weren't for black and brown, trans and queer people uh, carving out their space, taking up that space, naming it, demanding it, and, and having those fights, I mean, it's an argument. White people don't want to do that work. Um, and so without that resistance, I don't think that these HB2s would happen. You know, this, those state policies, they come out as a reaction to black mm -hmm. people getting liberated. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have an HB2 in 1999. We had an, a hate crimes, you know, problem that we were trying to talk about. And, you know, the white gays wanted marriage equality, but no one was like really, no one was like shutting things down because we needed marriage equality now, 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 well, now. Well, all of us you in know? C was a multiracial coalition of folks um, that I was a part of at the very tail end of it. And they were talking about, like, the dignity of families, but also, like, defining what is family, 
um, and really kind of reiterating some of the issues that were ignored because of marriage equality taking the lead in the forefront. It's like, yeah, we want to get married, but we also would love to have safety. And, and non-discrimination policies at our job <laughs> right. being federally recognized under, was it Title IX or uh, the title uh, non-discrimination federal mm-hmm. policy? Um, I can't remember right now, but... Um, yeah, I mean, just things like that. Like, if you can get discriminated, and we're also in an at-will state, you can get fired yeah, for just looking a certain way. Yeah, if black trans women are only making $15,000 a year, I would give up my, my marriage to yeah. make sure that black folks are, are living. Yeah. <laughs> so. And if black and brown queer and trans people can't be homeowners, like, who cares? Or if you can't, like, can't hold down a job and keep it if you're not the boss of something, if you're not so well-paid. Some of, so some of that work was, like I said, like, there's an issue, but then there's folks on the ground that are just trying to diversify the conversation or make it more nuanced. and Yeah. I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. You did that. You, you just you're were doing such a good idea. Me think of stuff, yeah. You're doing so, so much better than I am. What? Yeah, you're doing great. I don't know what she means by that. But... <laughs> you're doing great. But I yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah. Just going back and looking at it, like, I was, like, basically, uh, as much as we were all, we all loved each other, I was upholding whiteness in the ways that, like, our same very well-funded, very well-known, very uh, stable organizations that still exist today are still serving me and April's community, right? Like, and so how much service is she getting out of it? It's just not right. Like, and so I guess I'm just saying this because Mm -hmm. as white queer people, we can easily reflect on that and just figure out a new way to do it. And a lot of times a black person has been doing it. I really like how you are putting times and infusing your politics into them. You're doing a good job. Well, okay, thank you. Yeah, we got to get to Ani. <laughs> Speaking of gay. Like, <laughs> okay, well, thank you for both for speaking with me today, and we will pick up this conversation at a later date. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, God. Oh, God.